Let's grab a spot. Good morning to all of you. Come on in, grab a spot. Let's begin together. While you are looking for your seats, I uh, just want to say welcome to all of you. Uh, if you are newer with us, my name is Dean Delfos. I get to be one of the pastors here among the Country Bible Church family. We're glad that you're here. And to our members, regular attenders, thank you again just for your faithfulness to gather each week. Uh, it, is a, it is a treasured thing that we have each other in Christ Jesus. Um, so, uh, just as we work our way through some things to point out to you before we transition to the rest of uh, our time together this morning, let me remind you that we do have uh, these one-to-one Bible reading uh, books available for you for free in the foyer. Just take one as you go, uh, give it a look over, and then sign up to kind of walk through Scripture uh, with someone else in the church family to help you grow in your faith and help them grow in their faith as well. And then a few things that you'll notice on the bulletin that you might have received at the door when you came in, the women's breakfast uh, coming up uh, this coming Saturday. Um, sorry, that's July 31st, my bad. Uh, and that's at 8 o'clock. And then later on in that morning, uh, on July 31st, is a, is a discussion through uh, the next book, the biography book discussion, Fierce Convictions. That's at 10, 10 o'clock, so be mindful of that. And then at the beginning of August, the men's breakfast, and at the end of August, our outdoor service where we'll be able to observe baptism together and also, um, and also take in, God's willing, some new members. So be mindful of that. Um, if you would like to find out more about baptism um, and uh, prepare for that, I'll be huddling after the morning service just in this corner by the piano just for five minutes with anyone interested in uh, baptism. And if you are under 18 and want to be a part of that, uh, please bring a parent or guardian with you, and I'll, I'll huddle with you over there. All right, so we gather to praise the Lord. Let us stand together as His own Word calls us not only to worship, but because of the gospel, that's why we're called together. And I was reminded of that by one of you this week, so I'm really thankful for that. I think of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says that Christ died once, the just for the unjust, in order to bring us to God. And so how, now being reconciled to God, let us worship him together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. For your streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. Be your 
thoughts and prayers before the Lord. We've sung about blessed be the Lord's name when it's good and when it's not so good. And it wasn't always so good. From Psalm chapter 42, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Why are you cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation and my God. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and wave have gone over me. By day the Lord commands His steadfast love, and at night His song was with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to sail the same. Trust Him, how I proved 
this morning and lay these things down. Sometimes it's not matching up in our lives. And sometimes the burdens are heavy. And we confess it's usually because we're trying to carry more than you've asked us to do. And usually because we've come to you less than you want us to come to you. Teach us, Lord, humility, selflessness, resting in you giving you first place in our lives and acknowledging you in all things in your hand at work with no coincidences no chance your direction and guidance is there for us we will just come to you as little children the simple faith it doesn't demand to know everything about everything Thank you for the truths of these songs this morning, Lord. Burn them into our hearts. We rest and trust in you. In our Savior Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Glad to see you all here this morning. I will never take for granted again being able to meet together. This is my privilege this morning to read over you 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. So please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for doing what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good than it should be God's will than for doing evil. Let's pray. God, in the face of adversity of every kind, You are our hope. May your word prompt us to follow you today in every way as we depend on you. May you guide and direct our steps and our life, and may we never take for granted the hope that we have, the hope of glory. 
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we turn our attention to the text in earnest, um, I was struck with uh, just the need to continue in prayer together. Um, that is one of the main things for our gathering together is scripture and prayer. So I want to present to the Lord um, some request, and I want to do it together as a church family. Just more and more, our gathering should be a time of scripture and prayer. So once again, will you go with me to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, how you revealed yourself in Scripture, um, a God who is holy and just and merciful, um, who wants to be known as a God of mercy, um, how you are patient and long-suffering, and how you uh, put up with um, our inconsistencies and our rebellion um, decade after decade, uh, age after age. We thank you so much for your patience and endurance. Um, we praise you for um, your wisdom with which you are guiding the course of history and working out all things. We thank you for and we praise you for um, your power that's at work in every believer, uh, the same power that you use to raise Christ Jesus from the dead. So we praise you for um, a power that to us um, we barely can understand or appreciate um, a, a wisdom that baffles us uh, every time we think about the different twists and turns that life brings. Um, we, we praise you for um, your knowledge, how you don't miss any detail, not in our lives, not in our world, uh, and you are, um, and how you are related to your knowledge, you, you are... Um, you are intimately involved with all these things. We, we praise you for who you are and how you revealed yourself. We praise you for your holiness, that although you are compassionate and merciful and um, uh, moved by suffering, you are not affected by sin in any way. Um, how you um, draw close to sinners and yet remain spotless, and free and utterly trustworthy, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for the fact that you brought us together as a church family in Christ Jesus. You've taken us out of our normal lives, the normal course of our lives in rebellion to you, and you've turned us towards Christ Jesus and trusting him together. We will be with each other in your presence for all eternity by God's grace, by your grace, so we thank you for what you're doing and we pray that you would strengthen our church family. We thank you for the years of blessing that you provided for us um, as a, a little witness out here in the rural communities. For 40 years, you've chosen to lavish your grace on this church family, and we give you the praise and glory for that. You've seen us through um, difficult days. You've seen us through things that would have uh, torn us apart. You've seen us through so many things, and we praise you for your goodness. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide um, in these days of coming back together after COVID and, and picking up pieces and uh, enjoying summer rest for some and summer work for others and looking towards a new school year for students and uh, those who have students in their household. We praise you for what you're doing even in this time. And we pray, Lord, that in this time of relative safety and peace, we ask, Lord, that we would not take for granted, that we would not take for granted the blessings of being together. And so we thank you for it. We pray for wisdom for our elders. Um, these men that, as Paul said about the Ephesian elders, the Holy Spirit made them overseers of the church um, to watch over the flock of Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, for each one of them that you provide us individually and together the wisdom needed to give oversight and to shepherd well this church family that, in a way that would be pleasing to you in every way. And we pray, Lord, that um, for continued reconciliation and, um, and peace for uh, church members or regular attenders who have been affected over the last 18 months, two years of different disagreements, we pray for continued peace and reconciliation for our church family, that 
Christ Jesus would continue to be the center um, and the tie that binds us together. We thank you so much for weeks and months of good things that have been happening and good reconciliation that's been happening. And we pray, Lord, that you would just continue that work. We pray that for our church family, the overriding concern and priority for each of us individually, as families, and together as a family of families, we pray that your truth, the gospel, would be the the priority that shapes our desires and decisions, um, and that we would um, relish in the hope of glory that is ours all by your grace, and that we would do it together, and that more and more would shape the way we think and move and the way we uh, populate our calendars. We thank you so much for these relative days of peace to make progress in the gospel, and we pray that it would, it would deepen our fellowship together. We ask that the sermon coming up would be another piece um, moving us in that direction. We ask for our mayor, our governor, our president, uh, that you and your mercy would um, surround them with people whose hearts and minds have been changed and shaped by Jesus Christ, um, and so that more and more um, the things that impact our lives would um, provide opportunities for the gospel to advance. So we pray, Lord, for uh, those in authority over us in our government. We pray for those who are in authority and influential over us as a culture. Uh, Lord, I ask for the leaders of Apple and Amazon and Google, uh, just to name a few companies that impact the way we live and, and, um, and how we just go about using technology and things that shape us. We just pray for these people that your mercy would um, collide with their course of life and bring them to a saving knowledge of yourself and that you would help them to steer their companies in a way that reflects your priorities. We pray for school teachers and employees in our various school systems, that these are days of relative rest for them, and we pray, Lord, that you would bless them with rest of body and heart and mind in Christ Jesus and bring them to yourself or closer to yourself in these days. Um, We pray, Lord, for our missionaries that are serving, have been serving in Papua New Guinea. We pray that this time of uh, rest with their families and so forth would be refreshing to them and that you would bless the work as it continues without them for a season. And we ask, Lord, for uh, one of our partner churches, just that your blessings would be on Sower Church this morning uh, as they gather together. And once again, this church family would be a light for your name in that part of Lincoln where they serve you. Um, we think of the cruisies this morning and ask a uh, prayer for Jill, um, that you would continue to work in her recovery after surgery, and that uh, the various things that, um, that you've been doing in her heart and mind, Lord, would continue to strengthen uh, her view of you and that you would use these days uh, to recover her, her body and her soul. Um, we ask, Lord, for Donna as she um, is in the hospital. We just pray for uh, all that's happening with her in her recovery and uh, controlling the Parkinson's. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to provide wisdom for the family. And, uh, and if it's your will, Lord, just along uh, more days for her to fellowship with us and them. We pray for Dwayne DeBoer and his family as they uh, mourn the loss of Randy and try to go back to uh, the normal routines of life. We pray for um, his wife and family that they would that you would comfort them in their grieving. Uh, we pray, Lord, that um, the things that uh, are important to you would continue to shape the way we think. And the, the diversity of our church family would be a witness to the world that watches, even out here in the rural areas. And we ask that our daily lives this week, uh, at work and at home, would be pleasing to you. We pray that what we do at home would honor you um, and that would commend the gospel to our neighbors and those who we happen to open our home to. We pray that uh, people would be able to perceive relationships and even when there's disruption, Uh, or different things that would happen. We pray, Lord, that how we come together and work things out would all point to you and your goodness. We pray, Lord, that you would help us get past the embarrassment of bringing you up in social circles among unbelievers or believers. Help help us get past the awkwardness um, and to be able to 
um, so treasure Christ that you are glorified in the words we say and how we conduct ourselves, especially in front of unbelievers. Um, our days are limited. Um, our years are growing short. Um, and we pray, Lord, that one generation would commend your works to the next. And so we ask that you would do more in this gathering than we might have expected, especially with the time that's left. And we ask all these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Our passage in 1 Peter deals with fears, the things that the people in Peter's time had to deal with, the things that they were afraid of, the things that they were enduring, may or may not be a surprise to you. Fear is not something that is new to us. We all know and understand fears. If you were here last week, I publicly confessed my fear of doing any kind of dental procedure without strong painkillers. Uh, one survey that I found in studying polled Americans and talks about our greatest fears. Listen to this. Some people in the survey mentioned fear of animals such as snakes, spiders. I can, I can personally attest to those two. Uh, bees, bugs, bats, mice. Some animals can poison us, so you can understand those fears. They seem to make sense. People living in parts of Africa or the wilder parts of Africa uh, surely would list lions and hyenas in the things that they would be afraid of. Crocodiles, hippos have been known to capsize boats and attack people. Um, some of our fears are personal. We fear enemies and armies and strangers and death and loneliness. We fear public speaking. That one shocked me uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we fear singing in public. That is no shock to me at all. Uh, that's why if you've ever seen me on the worship team, there's never been a mic near me. Um, we fear all kinds of things, especially maybe um, not because those things are dangerous, but because they can lead to public embarrassment or humiliation. Uh, we fear places and spaces. Some people uh, fear of closed-in spaces, claustrophobia. Some people are afraid of wide-open spaces. Uh, we fear crowds, bridges, tunnels and storms. I am still the guy in my neighborhood who runs to the basement every time clouds roll in because I just am afraid of tornadoes while my neighbors sit on the porch and laugh. <laughs> and then our fears change over time. When there's a serious terrorist attack, we fear terrorism. When there's a nuclear incident, we fear radiation. People who, who have lived in communist countries, um, would be logically afraid of the secret police or concentration camps or starvation. Here in the West, people fear job loss and economic stagnation. Our fears cover things like cancer, flying, war, heights. I can barely stand on this platform. Um, among other things. And that all shows what Scripture calls our fear of death. We also fear bullies, we fear broken relationships, and as I have been saying for a while, we fear embarrassment. We can be afraid of safe things, as people tell me, uh, things like flying. I'm still afraid of it. I don't care how safe you call it. Or we can be afraid, we can not be afraid of things that are actually dangerous, um, like addictive medicines. We can shed our fear of public speaking every time we get up to say something. Just give it a try. And some other fears we take on over time, dealt with several spider bites this summer, when a spider bite lands you in a hospital, your fear of that can get dialed up. Our fears are varied. And Peter has talked about fear over and over again and over in this short letter. And today's text, as you, if you listened and followed along when Brandon read it for us, is no different. Chapter 3, verse 14 says, Have no fear of them, the second half of the verse, nor be troubled. A fear of people, or what some of your translations, what those people fear. Peter's calling us to a way of living 
that is radically different than the world around us. Over and over, Peter has been saying the only thing that we should actually fear is God. And of course, that kind of fear is a reverent fear, a kind of fear that puts him, or recognizes rather, the place he actually holds over our lives and over the world. And when our fear of God is right and rightly lived in, it pushes out other fears especially fear of other people. And that's this text. The more we fear God rightly in Christ Jesus, a right kind of fear, is the more it pushes out our fear of others. That's the thesis for this morning. Peter unpacks the logic of that thought in four steps in this passage. Step one, he proposes a question for us in verse 13. It's a really weird question. It's, it's not very much uh, obvious on the surface. The question is, verse 13, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? On the surface, it would seem obvious. Who is there to harm you if you make it your habit to do good? And our answer would be, no one. No one is going to harm us. No one's going to harm us if we are not troublemakers, but as the old Batman show would call it, do-gooders. Notice Peter's word there, zealous for doing good. Like, this is what gets you all riled up. Doing good. This is a thing that kind of gets you up in the morning, gets you out of bed, doing good. It's not just a passing thought. You give a lot of thought to, how can I do good? Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for doing good? Can that phrase describe you and I? People who are zealous for doing good. That phrase fits so well the context. Things that we looked at last week where if you are insulted, don't return an insult in return. If you are spoken badly about, don't speak bad about in return. Don't go about reviling for reviling. Don't put tit for tat. Don't put out revenge. Don't treat people the way they treat you. Scripture says, not only don't do that and just endure it, Scripture goes further. The verses just before this one goes further. When you are insulted, bless in return. Say good things about your, uh, your enemy in return. Or, more germane to the way Scripture thinks about blessing, ask God to enrich their lives with himself in return. Ask for blessing in return. It's such a countercultural, counterintuitive, counterhuman way of thinking. So it's no surprise or should be no surprise to us when verse 13 says, who's going to harm you if you are zealous for doing good because that zealous for doing good already closes in weird thinking like blessing in return for cursing. Or like how the Lord Jesus said, if somebody asks you to, if a soldier, Roman soldier, who's oppressing our nation, if a Roman soldier asks you, little Jewish boy, to carry his soldier pack one mile, carry it two without even being asked. If somebody wants your outer cloak, give them your inner cloak also. Somebody smacks you on the cheek, turn the other also. All those, literally or not, are communicating to us a different way of thinking than what comes naturally to us. It is a thinking that not only has the good of others in mind, it is a way of thinking that says, my whole life is before the living God. 
this shoulder to carry this backpack of the Roman soldier who's oppressing me is not an accident. The whole life is before the living God. He made the soldier, gave me this little energy, and providentially put this soldier and my pathway together right now. He did it on purpose. When, when you realize your whole life is before the living God, then the weird things Jesus taught his disciples to do in Every one of the four Gospels shouldn't seem that weird to you. And so Peter asked the weird question, who's going to harm you if you are zealous for doing good? And of course, even in the context of the letter so far, there is something in that sentence that still feels off because that's exactly what seems to be happening to them. They are trying to respond in a way that honors God. They're trying to respond to the world around them that doesn't like them anymore anymore, in a way that honors God. And bad things are being said about them. Their reputations are being twisted and maligned. They're being talked about at the water cooler. They're being gossiped about on social media. Their words are being twisted. People are causing them to suffer for doing good. Now, you'll notice I changed it a little bit from harm to cause to suffer. Because when Peter uses that phrase, who's going to harm you if you're zealous for doing good, it is different than suffering common suffering. The idea being carried out in that, in that question, who's going to harm you if you're zealous for doing good? It's harm, not hurt. It's harm, not hurt. And with this, once again, Peter widens our thinking to the future, to the last day, to the great and terrible day of the Lord when every person will stand before him Who is going to do you, to paraphrase, ultimate harm? It's like the kid who goes to the doctor afraid of needles, squirming around on his mother's lap. The nurse is trying to give him a shot, doesn't want it. And finally, the nurse puts her arm on his shoulder and says, I may hurt you, but I won't harm you. To be honest, to a little kid, who cares? You're still going to hurt me. To be honest, to adults. Sorry, I'll, I'll leave that alone. Peter's point is yes, you may suffer even when you are zealous for doing good, but you will not be ultimately harmed. He is trying to get us to open our point of view. So often when suffering hits, everything in the way we feel and think shrinks down to this moment. God, how could you let this happen to me right now? Didn't you see that just then I did something good that would please you? Everything in our thinking shrinks to this moment. And Peter's trying to stretch, stretch that opening, that porthole, that view, that window open wide enough to take in the rest of your life. All eternity live before the presence of the God of joy. No. Christ died for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. No one will ultimately harm you if you are zealous for doing good. And you see the flip, don't you? That's verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. You see it there? He he changed the harm to suffer. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Once again, bringing in what we learned from the paragraph last week, just earlier uh, in the chapter, verse 9, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, 
that you may obtain a blessing. And he brings, he echoes that promise back down here in verse 14 so we don't forget, so his readers don't forget. I know I'm trying to encourage you to do things that are just contrary to the way you naturally think. Don't forget, you will still be blessed. If you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Suffer for doing right. Suffer, suffer for standing for what's right. Righteousness described by God's word, not our own thoughts about what's right and wrong. We must learn to think our thoughts after God's word. Think our thoughts after him. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. And now, now he brings the, the responses that will come for this suffering for righteousness' sake. For Peter and his readers, they, they did not yet, we don't think from the evidence we can tell in the text, they're not under physical abuse for their stance for the gospel. From, the, from what we can tell from the letter of 1 Peter, 2 Peter, we think what they're going through is social, um, social suffering because they're Christians. And in some ways, similar to things that we're afraid of. Our fear of bringing up Jesus at work, at school, even in our own house. The awkwardness, the weirdness, the look, the eye roll, the glazed eyes, the social awkwardness, that you and I experience is 40 miles back from the social pressures they were experiencing. It is an amazing thing that we get to stand here and sing the name of Jesus. So there are responses. Two responses. First, two wrong responses. Peter says, have no fear of them, verse 14, second half, nor be troubled. Some of your translations put this in a slightly different way. Have no fear of, or don't fear what they fear, nor be troubled. So the question is then, based on the translation you might be reading, because the original language could be translated both ways, we have to fear them or not to fear what they're afraid of. And those two things aren't too different apart, so I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, cutting that finely. The overall thing here, though, is don't be afraid of them. And I think the ESV rendering is probably a little bit more accurate because this comes from a part of the Bible that we look at during Christmas time. In Isaiah chapter 7, at this time in history, King Ahaz was facing attack by a foreign nation, and it seemed ominous to him, and God's word to him through the prophet Isaiah was, don't be afraid of them, or don't fear what they fear. So, in this passage, I think don't be afraid of them, slightly wins out above don't fear what they fear. When you are a believer, your fear begins to shift. Not automatically, but by God's grace, inevitably. When we read phrases like this one, don't be afraid of them, or have no fear of them, or don't fear what they fear, it is partly why I said to you, a proper fear of God that dawns on us and grows within us drives out fear of others, even to some degree fear of what they fear, like death. At the same time, we do wrestle with these things. So, we do oftentimes fear the same things that unbelievers are afraid of. 
we do oftentimes fear death as well. We can, at the same time, be afraid of unbelievers themselves and their power over us. On purpose, I prayed for those in authority over us, our mayor, our governor, our president. Elected officials, yes, but yes, they have the power to change the way we live and move in the years ahead. And so Peter calls for us to honor those in authority over us, but not to be afraid of them. Never called to fear in the day of Peter's readers, the emperor, who had far more authority and power than a president. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of what they can do to you. Don't be afraid of the things that they are afraid of that keep them in line. No. Look at the contrast. Verse 15. Here is the proper response. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be shaken, troubled, rocked back on your heels. Don't get the wind knocked out of you. Don't be troubled. Don't let your course of following Christ be knocked off. Stay the course because on the contrary, instead of that, do verse 15 instead. But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's a mouthful and a very famous verse. Always be ready to give a defense, some of your translations say. That's a good, that's a good translation. Or a reason, logical foundation for why you are the way you are. A logical, clear understanding of the Christian hope. Be ready to give one. This, this word, reason for the hope, this, this phrase reason or defense, apologia, is where we get the phrase apologetics. It, it seemed to carry the idea of a courtroom scene. You're put on trial. That's how the word is commonly used. And you're going to give a defense. This is the reason why I did what I did or said what I said or acted the way I acted. But the way Peter uses it, when it's tied to the a reason for the hope that is in you and the always being prepared, doesn't all envision a courtroom scene. It can be used there. Definitely be ready for that. This is everyday life. Ready to give a reason for your hope. Everyday life. In the park. In the backyard. Everyday life. Out in the fields. Below the train engine. Working repairs, everyday life. Always ready. Always ready not only to share the gospel, but make a logical, clear, thoughtful explanation. Notice Peter says to be ready to do that. This takes preparation. This takes some time to think through how would I explain the reason for my hope? Maybe I should back up. Because do you see what triggers the need for an explanation? You have been asked about why you're so hopeful. You have been asked about your hope. The trigger, the thing that pushes this conversation forward is yes, we should take time to initiate conversation with those who don't know Christ Jesus yet and explain the gospel to them. 
But Peter is calling for, in addition to that, Peter is calling for a lifestyle that triggers questions. How is it that you don't act the way we act? When that dude just insulted you, I heard what you said, and I heard how he twisted his wor- your words. How come you don't act the way I would act? Why are you different? What's the matter with you? Or what's the matter with me? Right back to chapter 1. You and I have been born again to a living hope that is kept in heaven for us that can neither spoil nor fade or fade. A living hope. And Peter says, always be ready to give a reason for that hope that you have. And if you ask me, Pastor Dean, just to be really transparent with you, I don't feel really hopeful. Well, first I would try to comfort you and say, well, Peter's not really first talking about how you feel. Not first. But Peter does want you to reconnect with what's waiting for you. Peter wants you to live with every time you look at the world, not just to understand that you are living before the face of God, Coram Deo. He wants you to remember that every time you do anything, think about anything, think on this. Not only is God watching, but your Father is watching with your inheritance waiting for you. Like you get to be forever with Him. It is a loving watch, not a scowl. Maybe I should say that again to myself. It is a loving watching over, not a scowl. You have been born again into a living hope. You didn't earn it. You didn't clean yourself up enough to get it. You put all your faith in what Christ did on that cross when he took our sin. That you and I stand before the living God with Christ's righteousness, not our own. And that we get that not by cleaning our lives up or turning over a new leaf, but simply trusting Him. It is the reason why this verse 15 starts with this whole concept of in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Or in some of your translations, in your hearts, set apart apart Christ as Lord. The two translations are still trying to echo the same thing. Christ is Lord of all things. Again, coming from Isaiah 7. Christ is Lord. And in our hearts, not just in the way we feel, but in the way we think, in in the way we make decisions, Not only remember that God is watching, but that Christ, the Lord of all, is yours. You are united to him. That's that's how Paul would say it. Peter would say, when Peter says, honor Christ the Lord as holy, or set apart Christ the Lord in your hearts. He's trying to say, remember who Jesus is. He is not on a cross, obviously. He's not in a tomb. He is risen. But he's not just alive. He is reigning. That's what we covered in Sunday school. It seems like every time we open a page in the New Testament, this biblical writer is giving some reference to the fact that Jesus is exalted over every other authority, which means that he is over all things. He's controlling all things. He's giving direction to all things. He's got authority over all things. Or Colossians chapter 1, he made all things, and all things were made through him and for him. So your body is not your own. Your life is not your own. He made it and he made it for himself. And finally, finally the frustration can end. Finally the years of living for yourself can end and you can live for the person you were made to live for and all things can work as they should be. Your body, your heart, your mind given over to the Christ who loved you and made you because you were made for him. And finally your life can live in the harmony of what it was made for. 
So you fall out of favor and out of harmony with the world around you, and you fall in favor and in line with the God who loves you. In your hearts, don't make that true. It's already true. In your hearts, cherish it. Cherish it. Treasure it. Hug it. Kiss it. Love it. Hold it. Snuggle with it. Hold it dear. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Like, curl in the fetal position around it. You're not making this true. You're embracing it. You're embracing Christ, the Lord of all things. Our love of comfort and ease is what consciously or unconsciously helps us make some decisions. Your conscious treasuring of Christ and his lordship over all things, including your life, can start to have a conscious and unconscious effect on the way you do and respond to all things. When Christ and his rule over all things and you being united to him in love becomes the thing you treasure, it will affect the way you remember your hope. And that will have an effect on how you live before family, friends, believers, unbelievers. And you'll be asked, why are you different? Why are you different? It can happen in an instant. It could hap- it's probably been happening in your life subtly and with peaks and valleys for believers in this room. Peter says to his readers, we are already living in dark days where people have been experiencing some suffering even for doing what is good. Make sure that your hold on Christ Jesus as treasure and Lord gets a little tighter. For you and I in relative ease and comfort and freedom, we can all see some things being put into place The thing to run to is not this fix or that fix. The thing to run to and hug closely is Christ the Lord. So Peter says to us once again, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, in the way you think, choose, feel, honor Christ the Lord as sacred as holy, as not common, but precious. How do we do that? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason of the hope that is in you. And yet because he is our Lord and our love, we respond and give a defense, and we try to keep in check that little slippery slope from making a defense of the gospel to making a dig to our offender. You know, just kind of say it in sort of a subtle little witty way that not only do you get your point across, but your accuser looks stupid. You come out looking all witty and awesome. The gospel looks all bright, shiny, and logical, and your accuser looks stupid and foolish. Peter says, don't do that. I say, Peter says, don't do that. Don't craft your words to make other people look stupid. That's what the world does. Yes, show the holes in the thinking, but do it with gentleness. And the translation in the ESV is respect. Some of your translations will say reverence. Because what's behind there is not just respect for, hey, this is Caesar, or this is the mayor, or this is the president, or this is whoever, this is my coworker, this is my boss. The respect, the fear, the reverence is Godward. The gentleness is towards man. The reverence, fear, respect is Godward. Peter calls us to do this, which feels so alien to the way 
not only we think, but just the air we breathe, man. Like the people who are most honored in our culture are the witty ones who, call, who make everyone look foolish with three words. Peter's calling us to the opposite. He says, verse 16, having a good conscience. Notice the Godwardness of that. That's, that, that's the, the inner you that not only knows what's right, remnants of um, life before the fall, God's law written on the heart, but now supercharged by the Holy Spirit. Having a good conscience. This is why I say the respect, reverence, or fear, honor is Godward. Verse 16, having a good conscience. The part of me that only God can see, God knows. I'm living in fear of him, having a good conscience that when you are slandered or spoken bad about, those who revile your good behavior in Christ Jesus may be put to shame. That's the thing that puts him to shame, your good behavior, not your cutty words. Although they try to poke you and rally you up and get a, get a rise out of you in response to you, you stay the course, honoring God with a good conscience, and the shame begins to come as the pokes and jabs continues. I am doing this to this guy, and he won't respond the way I want him to. Either they realize it now, or on that great Lord's day that's coming, not so long from now, they will know. And then it might seem obvious, this is Peter's last little sentence in his logical paragraph here about responding awkwardly, but to God's glory. Verse 17, again, it might just seem so obvious. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. You should know how many commentators I've read who so there's got to mean something else because that, that seems so generic and prosaic and obvious. But let me ask you, how often do you think you're standing up for Christ and your witty comments and your cut downs are doing good and they aren't at all in line with this text? The doing good is not so obvious because the remnants of sinful nature still at work in us excuse all of our half good, half evil words. I'm just defending myself. I'm defending Christ. That's why Peter says, be zealous for doing good, not just kind of toy with, being, with doing good. Be someone, become someone by God's grace who is zealous for doing good because that way you know with a clear conscience before God that you are suffering not a response to some good and a lot of my jacked upness. I'm actually suffering for doing good. If that should be God's will. Once again, God and his sovereignty is absolutely in line with this. It is better to suffer with a clear conscience that it everything before God who knows, Christ who is Lord and love, and a conscience that is clear than for doing evil. Strong words about what's good because we need help. We need God to tell us what is good. We need God's help to appreciate the fact that in Christ Jesus, we were given a clear conscience. And every time something happens and we step out of line with what God has revealed he wants his children to act like, there is forgiveness and restoration and the conscience can be clean again. Why? Because we're sincere? Because we're worthy? No, verse 18, for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. It is Christ who is to dominate the way we think and every facet of our responses. Just by way of confession, and maybe this will help you in some way. So often when I am awake in the moment of struggle and 
choosing to respond in a way that I think would honor God, I tend to do what's been called passive aggression. Do you have any idea what it is to be passive aggressive? Do you know anybody who's passive aggressive? You're the pastor, I hear you. <laughs> All those passive-aggressive people, old hands, just kidding. Uh, I'm just saying, like, the whole clear conscience thing cuts very deeply. And the cut is not to harm, but to heal. Make sure our motives, through and through, is a clear conscience before God that my words and my intentions is not to secure pity for myself or win things for my favor or blah, 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 blah. But is God honoring through and through and trusting God to deal with it. If I should suffer, it is probably God's will. Let me trust. I realize this is like Sunday part two in the Sermon of Heaviness. But Peter is taking what is ringing in his ears from the Lord Jesus Christ and bringing it to us. And I, I can't help but remember, because we just did Mark, when Peter was confronted by a servant girl around a campfire about his attachment to Jesus. And he denied it to her and those around three times. What do you think was going through his mind as he penned this paragraph? Did he feel again the guilt and shame of failing his Lord in that moment? Probably. Probably. How long do you think that lasted? Probably not very long. Because his good Lord probably reminded him of another campfire, John 21. And how the Lord questioned him three times, Peter, do you love me? And restored him. Now on this side of the cross, there is restoration. And so Peter can write these words to us. When you're questioned about your attachment to Christ Jesus, have you failed in the past? A clear conscience is available today. Reconciliation to God in Christ Jesus is for all of us. Who would have it? Simply reach out to him by faith. Confess. Ask forgiveness. Trust in the finished work of Christ. And move on. Would you stand? And let me pray for you. So, Holy Father, as a church family, we stand under your word, and now having been um, seen clearly by it, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would help us now continue to process this, and think on these things, and conform the way we respond more and more in a way that is pleasing to you through and through. And so we ask that this time in your word would not be wasted and that it would bear fruit for your glory in our changed lives, in our treasuring of Christ, sacred and precious and Lord of all. And if we should suffer, Lord, help us to remember. Help us to remember to please you even in that. And we ask for your help in this. And we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
How can it be the one who died has borne our sin through sacrifice, conquered every sting of death, sing, sing hallelujah. For joy awakes as morning light when Christ is light. in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you.